Good afternoon, y'all. It's Joe. We're back under the shade tree. I've got my crappy worn out t-shirt on, which means I'm fixing to do some dirty work. Uh, Ethel has been running okay if you know how to drive it. Uh, there's been some issue with the plenum gasket leaking. Uh, for anybody that's familiar with the, or not familiar with these Dodge Magnum motors, uh, I'll give you a little bit of education on them. Um, but basically the long and short of it is the plenum gasket on the bottom side of the intake manifold has been leaking, which causes the engine to run lean, which causes pinging under load. And hopefully I haven't done any serious damage. Uh, when she starts pinging, obviously I go ahead and I back out of the throttle, but it's been more prevalent now that I've been using overdrive and torque converter lock up a little bit more. So um, it's, November in Oklahoma, right now it's about 77 degrees, but the sun's fixing to go down here in about two hours. So I'm scrambling to get done what I can today. Uh, I have a spare intake manifold. Uh, I apologize for the wind. Uh, again, it's November in Oklahoma, so there's that. Uh, but like I said, I've got a spare intake manifold that I'm going to go ahead and swap on. I've been getting it prepped, ready to go with some minor modifications to it. And um, I'll show you what's going on here in just a quick second. Okay, so as you can see right there, I've got the spare intake manifold flipped upside down. I've got the plenum, plenum pan off. Uh, it's a spare. I'm not going to go ahead and replace the steel pan, and I'll explain that here in just a quick second after this wind passes by. Okay, so the way Chrysler designed these things, um, in order to go ahead and be able to cast the manifold like they did, they had to go ahead and cast it in two pieces. Uh, the bottom piece is this plenum pan right here, which is steel. And unfortunately, steel and aluminum don't have the same expansion rates. Uh, that and the bolts that they used were just a hair too long, or at least that's the theory. And so what ends up happening is this gasket right here begins to fail and it leaks and it draws air and oil in. And when you look down the throttle bore, this bottom pan right here, instead of being dry steel, is wet. Uh, it's wet with engine oil. It's been seeping in, pulled in by vacuum. And that's where your vacuum leak comes in, which is why your engine runs lean, which is why it pings and does all sorts of unfortunate things if you don't go ahead and address the issue. Uh, there's a couple different remedies. Uh, some folks just go ahead and replace it, replace the gasket, seal it up with sealer, uh, change the bolts and call it good. Others will go ahead and take an aluminum plate to replace the steel plate and use different fasteners and seal it up that way. And then there's yet another bunch that will go ahead and actually um, weld the aluminum uh, replacement plate onto the bottom of the manifold. And obviously that's the, the best answer on all cases if you can go ahead and find somebody that's capable of welding aluminum and does a good job and will guarantee that it's airtight. Um, I did go ahead and buy a replacement aluminum plate, which is a quarter inch thick, uh, more substantial than this piece of steel right here, which is uh, not quite eighth of an inch thick, so uh, at least a good sixteenth of an inch thick. But anyway, um, I'm not going to worry about this steel pan. Like I said, this is a spare from that manifold sitting over there. Uh, the plan is that I've got the aluminum plate. I'm going to go ahead and put on that other manifold there. I also went ahead and installed a uh, volume replacement, or I'm sorry, volume reduction plate kit, um, which enhances the torque off the bottom end of the engine. Uh, so basically from idle up, it's got higher torque than it would stock because the, the plenum volume inside that uh, half keg looking intake manifold is much smaller. So anyway, uh, that being said, I'm fixing to go ahead and get things put together here. I can't go ahead and do it all in one day. So this video is going to take a couple days to get done, but I'm taking advantage of the weather because it's fixing to go ahead and turn again being November. So stand by one. Alrighty, now one more little tidbit for you folks that aren't familiar with these uh, Dodge Magnum type engines. I'm going to tell you that if you ever decide to take this job on, be prepared to spend some time because what will happen inevitably is these bolts on the front right there 
and right there, and the two on the back right here and right here will more than likely break off. If you're lucky, it may only be one or two. If you're unlucky, it'll be all of them. And what you're gonna need to do is go ahead and have your wire feed welder handy and just go ahead and plan on welding a nut onto what remains of that bolt to go ahead and pull down your cylinder head. Just weld that nut on there and it'll go ahead and back right out when you go ahead and put a wrench on it. Uh, the expansion from the heat going ahead and working with that uh, remains of the bolt. We'll go ahead and break it loose and it'll help you get it out of there. Uh, I'm hoping I will not have that issue because I went ahead and put that manifold on maybe three years ago, maybe two, I don't remember. So hopefully they will not rust into place. What happens is on the cylinder head side down here, those corner bolts are exposed on the bottom. They don't go into the head or they go into the head, but they don't go into a blind pocket. Uh, they go through the head and then they're exposed on the bottom side. So they go ahead and rust in place. These things are only like 12 foot pounds. They're not a whole lot of torque to them. They're not very substantial bolts. It's all thread and um, they are very easy to break. So don't be surprised if you break one. Plan on breaking one. Plan on breaking more than one, but just be prepared. Uh, that's why I'm trying to go ahead and get this started now because I've got this afternoon, I've got tomorrow afternoon after work, and then I have Tuesday is supposed to be halfway decent, overcast, but warm. And then after that, the bottom falls out and it's going to be crappy and rainy. So I'm going to try and get this knocked out here pretty quick. If I can get all the disassembly work started today, uh, I'll get everything done that I can and then just leave the manifold in place until it's actually time to go ahead and take it off and get the swap done. So, okay, so just in case it wasn't very clear earlier, shed some light on the subject here. Look down inside of there. Let's see if I can do this. Look at all that oil residue down in there, okay? Clearly it was leaking is leaking and therein is part of the problem and fortunately I went ahead and asked somebody very knowledgeable about this as to why it's doing this and he was able to go ahead and tell me oh hey by the way so normally old days you go ahead you had an engine that would start to ping or knock and you would go ahead and increase your octane rating you know run high octane gas premium gas uh, throw octane boost in the tank, the whole bit. That doesn't cure this problem. That doesn't even come close to addressing this problem. Believe me, I tried. Uh, my first thought was, well, hey, it's got a custom tune. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe, just maybe, um, it's running too lean uh, under uh, throttle. Yeah, no, that's not, well, it's running too lean under throttle, but it's not because of lack of fueling. It's because of an air leak. Basically a big vacuum leak inside the plenum, the intake manifold plenum plate. So there we are. All right, so folks, there it is. This is my stopping point for the day. Uh, the sun is starting to go down. You can see it out there. Um, I made good progress. Like I said, I can stay out here probably. I can finish this up tonight, but I've got, you know, uh, responsibilities, Doug. I Besides the wind, thank you, wind. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, I, I've got horses to take care of and everything else. I mean, it's not all fun and games here at Bachelor Land. So anyway, um, we'll go ahead and get back after this tomorrow. Oh my God. It's... I don't think there's a storm drain over there, but there might be a clown hiding in that muck. I don't know. Something Stephen King about this just really freaks me out. And yes, in case y'all didn't believe, I'm doing bachelor things in the kitchen. That intake manifold is all sealed up on the bottom and ready to go.
Afternoon folks, uh, we're back under the shade tree and as you can probably hear the uh, wind noise in the background It's even breezier today than it was yesterday and I'm not a huge fan of working Out here in the dust and dirt in Oklahoma with the engine sitting wide open to the elements Yeah, I mean it's not gonna be open that long, but at the same point I'm tired <laughs> I know that's not well. That's me making an excuse. I am tired. I woke up at three o'clock this morning, thinking it was four o'clock, not even having to wake up till five o'clock, and so that's my own fault. But um, I'm not the sharpest crayon in the box today. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that right now. I can get out here and get after this. I can probably get this job finished today. Uh, that being said, the weather's supposed to be less windy tomorrow, and I have the entire day off. I have all the parts I have, or one more time in English, I have all the parts I need on hand to do the job, do the job right, and finish the job and be driving Ethel by the time I'm done. And here, here's that wind I'm talking about, that breeze, because it is Oklahoma, it is breezy. And it's nice out, don't get me wrong, it's like 75 degrees out, which for October, or November is not bad. But the reality of it is I really, don't want to be out here working with dust blowing around into the engine. Uh, it's gonna be bad enough. I got to scrape gaskets on the intake side, or at least on the uh, the cylinder head side. Uh, and I, you know, th those little bits are gonna to want to try and get down inside the engine. And normally, I'll put a rag down and try and keep that stuff collected up so it doesn't get inside the engine. But at the same point, now I'm also battling battling the breeze that's trying to blow it into the engine. So. Rather than screw with that, today, uh, tomorrow is supposed to be a front pushing through. I'm tired and I can't talk. There's supposed to be a front pushing through uh, from north to south, and it's supposed to stall out about mid state, which pretty much means uh, the wind's going to be pretty much non existent to minimal tomorrow versus today, or at least in the middle of the day, depending on how hard this front comes in, it's supposed to be a non event. So, I think I'm going to throw the dice and uh, maybe slack a little bit today. Like I said, I am exhausted. Um, it, it wasn't a bad work day. It, it's just a, a lack of sleep night. And so, rather than go ahead and make the mistake of forging on and forcing the issue, trying to go ahead and work tired, uh, knowing that I'm... Um, probably going to make a mistake that I normally wouldn't. I don't want to take that chance. I want to destroy something. So uh, that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and sign off for today and we'll finish this project tomorrow and we'll finish it right. So there we have it. Okay. So yeah, I said I wasn't going to do much today, but uh, you know, I really want to get done with this too. So I'm going to go ahead and continue the disassembly um, up to the point of actually breaking the manifold completely loose. Uh, I'll, I'll pull the hardware and whatnot. I'll pull the fuel line and all that. I've got the cooling system pretty well drained at this point. I went ahead and ran the uh, that piece of heater hose. Like I said yesterday, I ran that down into another antifreeze jug that I had and got about another quart out. Um, so it's below the level of the water pump now, or at least at the water pump level now, so it's below the intake manifold. So hopefully I won't end up with too much water in the motor, and um, this should go a little bit easier. And we'll see how things are going to turn out. Uh, so there we have it right now. I've got the throttle body taken off the motor. It's just kind of hanging around. Uh, I've got, got to go ahead and disassemble the heater hose. Hey, hey, do that actually. Uh, disassemble, not the heater hose, gosh darn it, the upper radiator hose which I'm going to go ahead and replace anyway and get that out of the way. I've also got to figure out which of those two sensors is the right one for the computer. Uh, should be fairly simple. One of them has one wire that goes to it, the other one has two. So uh, I've just got to look at my schematics and the, the big book of knowledge and factor that out real quick. Uh, the wire harness on the driver's side of the motor. Now I've got most of the stuff out of the way. Once I get that fuel line undone, that'll be easy. Uh, one other thing I noticed yesterday while I was uh, finishing up the intake manifold in the kitchen. Yes, in the kitchen. I don't know if we've got the intake manifold. Whenever 
over here on the passenger side. The earlier manifold has one, two, three vacuum ports on the side of it. This one right here being for the PCV, oh, there we go, the PCV valve. The other motor, or I'm sorry, the other intake manifold only has one port, the smaller one for the cruise control. So, I'm going to go ahead and manufacture a shaped uh, line to go ahead and do that using a combination of um, that uh, black nylon plastic hard line they use and some rubber fittings, a couple of elbows to bring that around the back side of the motor, Lord willing, from the driver's side around to hook into this PCV valve. I think that'll work out pretty well. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. It's uh, It'll either go around the back or the front, but ideally I'd like it to go around the back if I can. So, because I really don't feel like moving valve covers around, that's kind of a pain in the butt and just obnoxious. So, anyway, all in good time. Okay, so I'm not making big tracks doing this, so I'm just doing it. Uh, I do need to go ahead and take either some compressed air or the shop vac or maybe both and clean up all this dirt and crap along the valley uh, on either side of the intake manifold because crap acquires up there and stupid dirt daubers build nests back in here on the side of the intake manifold. Not that it matters because that's going to come off, but I don't want to get dirt and crap in the motor. As far as this little bypass hose right here, I'm going to replace that damn thing anyway. Um, I really brutalized the bejesus out of it taking it off with a pair of channel locks. Uh, the rubber got bruised, I'm sure, and you know, the, the location's not exactly prime to uh, replace if you have to, so why not just put a new one on? It's not terribly expensive and uh, save myself some headache down the road. So anyway, there's that. Uh, it, it's kind of messy looking right now, uh, but you can see that the coolant level is down below. Uh, the cylinder heads at this point below the water pump or somewhere thereabouts so at least i shouldn't lose too much water into the motor itself not that i'm overly worried about it i've got fresh motor oil to put in uh, i'd already planned on doing that anyway and drain the other stuff out even though i just did an oil change on here recently uh probably gonna end up pulling some spark plug wires off the distributor cap to keep them out of the way the nice thing about this just like every other small block Mopar is that you can swap the intake manifold without having to pull the distributor out. And since I don't have to pull the distributor out, I don't have to monkey with uh, oh god uh, uh, wait a minute I know this uh, fuel sink thank you yeah how about that I don't have to worry about setting the fuel sink again uh, it was kind of a pain in the butt to do it the first time I don't have a computer to do it or a scan tool or anything like that so it was kind of trial and error and a lot of fiddle farting around and feeling for it. But I got it. It runs. And I'm not going to screw it up. So anyway, that's where we stand right now. I just got to clean the rest of this mess up so I can take that manifold loose. I just checked the weather and tomorrow uh, this breeze should just be just a really light variable breeze tomorrow. And it should be perfect for doing this. So... Um, I'm not going to worry about breaking the bolts loose. I'll probably break those back too loose just so I know in my mind that uh, I'm not going to have to worry about uh, going ahead and welding a nut on and chasing one back out of there. I will say these intake manifold bolts were specced to be single-use bolts. Um, like I said, they're only 12 foot-pounds. It's not like there's that much torque load on them. But because the front two and the back two are notorious for breaking, they recommend changing them as a set when you go ahead and, and do the plenum gasket or the intake uh, manifold maintenance. So I have a new set, but I'm going to save these uh, just in case or for down the road when I actually do the cylinder heads. Uh, I'll have a, a set on hand and I'm going to go ahead and put anti-seize back on the, the, the corners just to be sure. Uh, Save myself some headaches down the road, don't you know? So anyway, there we go. We're almost ready. 
Oh, it's amazing what a little compressed air will do for you. Got that whole mess cleaned out on both sides over there. Uh, it's not spotless, but at least it's not going to rain dirt down inside when I break that seal loose. So hooray for that. Okay, so there we have it. The front two are out. The back two are out. Uh, I didn't break anything, so the rest of it should be easy. Knock off plastic. Uh, here they are, and I lied. I thought I put anti-seize on those, and obviously I did not. I just got really, really, really lucky. These two crusty bastards came off the front. Okay, these guys here came off the back. Um, I guess the reason that the two off the front are a little bit crustier is probably from washing the engine from time to time. Uh, more exposure to moisture up at the front than there is at the back. Because I just do a half-ass job washing the motor, I guess. Uh, <laughs> anyway. I think I'm going to put something on those next time that I install the manifold, well, like tomorrow. Um, put something on there to try and keep the, the bolts from rusting into the head and potentially breaking off. I don't know, maybe, um, heck, maybe some of that right stuff. If I get some of that on the threads, uh, that might go ahead and help at least prevent it from rusting in place. Um, and, and again, those are going to get taken off here probably in the next six months for when I do the cylinder heads. But uh, regardless, yeah, save myself some headaches, save myself some work. Um, as you can see, the sun is already starting to go down now because I slacked off for a while. I was thinking about halfway taking a nap and I didn't. But uh, anyway, uh, it is what it is. Time to go ahead and stop doing what I'm doing for now and go feed the horses. I got the throttle body hanging by cables out of the way. Um, like you said, everything else over here is undone now. So uh, one vacuum port gets capped, the other vacuum port goes to the brake booster. See the fuel inlet for the fuel rail. Uh, the fuel rail and injectors will get transferred over to the other manifold. I have some new injectors. I may just go ahead and install those while I'm at it. Um, because I got them. Yeah, why not? Uh, it's supposed to be a fresh set. These are working fine, but you know, I already bought the other ones when I was trying to go ahead and, and sort out some other issues before I got the fuel sink set right. Hmm, go figure. Oh, wait. Maybe it was because I was trying to run OBD2 stuff on OBD1. Hmm. Anyway, that being said, time to go feed the critters. We will see y'all tomorrow. All right, well, here we are back at it today. Uh, as you can probably hear, the fence charger's clacking away, which means that the uh, wind has died down. So we're gonna go ahead and tear into Ethel today and finish this job off once and for all. Let's get after it. All righty, so one thing to keep in mind, guys, uh, last time I had this engine opened up, the intake manifold off. Morning, Louie. The uh, engine was on an engine stand and was not in the truck. And when I did put the engine in the truck, I had the front clip off. Uh, so I didn't have any fenders to worry about or work around the radiator or anything like that. Uh, for the Dodge guys who have to do this job, or sometimes even the Jeep guys, because they use the same engine platform in the uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee, usually the intake manifold is underneath the shelf back here under the cowl and so this portion back here is covered up pretty well and there's very little room to work it's a pain in the butt thank goodness i don't have that issue but i still have the issue <clears throat> of trying to go ahead and work in the engine compartment which uh it is what it is i mean we, we do this all the time uh, any car guy that's ever worked on a motor has had to work in the engine compartment before so nothing new there but uh when I ran all the bolts loose, I'm going to go ahead and blow this thing out one more time with compressed air to get the rest of the dirt and stuff off. Because, you know, when I went ahead and broke the bolts loose on the uh, driver's side over here, I broke up Mr. Dirt Dobber's nest and all that dirt fell down in here now. So I'm going to blow all that out. But no broken bolts. 
no big deal. And I guess, you know, if you really wanted to, you could probably put studs in, uh, or at least, you know, stud those corners and not have to worry about it so much. But the reality of it is how often should you have to pull off the intake manifold? You really shouldn't have to worry about broken bolts. So, you know, studs is probably overkill. And then for the uh, Dodge and Jeep guys that uh, have these things, uh, you're back to the issue of trying to go ahead and have clearance underneath that uh, shelf or the cowl to uh, get that manifold lifted up to clear the studs. So, don't know if that'd be worth that headache or not. I guess in reality, the best answer would be to go ahead and fix it right, fix it once, and be done with it. So, uh, yeah, studs would be overkill. I'm not going to worry about okay. that. Okay, so there we have it. We've got all the dirt blown off out of there. What's left of the dirt dauber nest is cleared out. Got that extra coolant spilled cleared out. And the nice thing about this, more than anything else, is those injector rails right there. Those are going to make some nice handles to go ahead and pick that thing up because as aluminum intake manifolds go, this one's kind of heavy. But it uh, should be pretty simple to go ahead and pop that off and use those uh, injector rails like a handle to lift that sucker up off of there. Now, this sucker was pretty well glued. <laughs> Um, when I put it together, I used a little bit of sealer around the water jackets where they, uh, they meet the intake manifold, uh, the water passages. Um, I also went ahead and used some uh, uh, RTV along with cork gaskets, which I don't normally use, but uh, it, it's what I had available. It took some work. I mean, those bolts are only torqued down to 12 foot-pounds but I had to really pry on it to pop this sucker loose with this pry bar. <laughs> and that's exactly how I did it, it was that right there. It took some doing, but it popped. All right, so there we have it. Uh, one gasket stayed on the motor. Actually, I, I take that back. One gasket stayed on the intake manifold, uh, passenger side. Uh, the cork gaskets stayed on the Chinese wall and the... Uh, driver's side gasket stayed put so gonna have a little bit of cleanup to do in here uh, throw a rag down in the lifter valley and clean off the gasket stuff i don't have one of those mortsky fancy super duper scraper tools so i'm gonna have to go ahead and do it with the uh, scotch bright on a air grinder and check out that fancy freaking oil pressure sending unit setup. So there I've got my oil pressure sending unit for the computer. And I've got my T off the side to go ahead and run the uh, mechanical oil pressure gauge. So there's that. I don't know if the computer needs oil pressure reading or not. But uh, either way, I've got both ends of it covered. So there's that. And like I said, those fuel rails came in really handy. They made a nice handle to go ahead and lift that piece up and out. Yeah. Made my life a whole lot easier because that's kind of awkward working in there. And for what it's worth, this is honestly a junkyard motor. I paid $400 for this motor and put a camshaft in it and fresh valve springs to work with the cam. But overall, it's pretty darn clean inside. Uh, it wasn't abused. It was supposed to have been under 100,000 miles, but reality is, it is what it is. It's a $400 junkyard motor. So, it motors down the road just fine, other than the plenum gasket leaking. It wasn't really having oil issues. It doesn't smoke or anything like that. Uh, the new heads are, well, number one, they, they were kind of rare, and I got a smoking deal on them. And number two, uh, the factory heads are known to crack, although the cracks are uh, innocuous. How about that big word? Uh, they crack, but they don't necessarily cause problems. So, um, you know, a lot of people freak out about it, myself included. I'm not super fond of the idea of driving around with cracked cylinder heads, but at the same point, if it's not causing any issues, um, it's not that big a deal and there's literally um, hundreds of thousands of these trucks on the road today still 
driving around with high mileage and cracked cylinder heads and they get down the road every day just fine. So, you know, it, it's one of those things. If you let it bother you like I do, um, address it. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Just keep on driving. Okay, so clean up and prep is what always takes me the longest. And yeah, I did what I could to try and minimize coolant getting into the motor, but at the same point, it's gonna happen. Uh, I already have fresh oil for this, but I don't like the idea of coolant just hanging out the motor where it doesn't belong anyway. And so I'm gonna use a paper towel here to wick up the coolant from the spider here. There we go. Or from the lifter valley where it uh, splashed in at the back of the motor. Um, you know, just trying to go ahead and, and keep as little or get as little coolant in uh, places it doesn't belong as possible. So anyway, there's your cheap uh, redneck tip of the day. Just use a paper towel and do that and that'll get some of the oil or some of the water up out of the oil or the coolant up out of the oil. So you don't have so much that ends up down the oil pan before you go ahead and drain it out. And I've got another paper towel set off to the side here. Just go ahead and finish this up. Alrighty, so the intake ports are stuffed with paper towel. I've got an old t-shirt laying in the lifter valley. And I've got my favorite implement of destruction. i ready to go ahead and clean up my gasket surfaces. Uh, again, this isn't quite as handy as the Mortski tool, but it works pretty well. Um, red scotch Bright pad on this little guy right here. And it cleans up pretty nice, pretty quick. So... Uh, T-shirt will catch the majority of the little bits. Uh, that and the paper towels will go ahead and keep them from getting down the intake ports. And again, there's going to be fresh oil going in this motor and obviously a, a fresh oil change shortly thereafter just to make sure I get all the other little bits out. But uh, again, this is a $400 junkyard motor, so the only real investment in it other than my time is the camshaft and valve springs. So, there we go. And there you can see what's going on. Cleaned up the uh, wall of shine up front pretty nice. It's cleaned up the other surfaces pretty nice. You can see the uh, residue getting caught by the t-shirt. So there's that. Uh, I gotta let the air compressor build back up one more time and we'll get this uh, cleaned up, wiped down, and ready for fresh gaskets. All right, so there's that. I'm gonna go ahead and hose it down with some carburetor cleaner, get all the surfaces clean and dry. Uh, the only part I really couldn't do very well with the air tool was back around the distributor. Um, yeah, I could pull the distributor out and, you know, mark the, in or index the location on the block and everything else. And I could be pretty darn close as far as the fuel sink goes. But the fuel sink on these is such a ginormous pain in the ass to have done, especially when you don't have a computer to verify it, that, uh, it's, I'll just go ahead and scrape it by hand and call it good. <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in all honesty, yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. So anyway, I'm time to go ahead and pull this junk out of here and uh, hose everything down and start putting gaskets and sealer on. Alrighty, so one more upgrade while we're digging around in here. Uh, I'm going to put a splash pan in the lifter valley that'll go ahead and help uh, keep the intake manifold a little bit cooler. It keeps uh, hot oil off of the plenum plate. And that's this guy right here. Okay, this is another one of those Utah Awesome products. Um, Marty Fletcher, the guy that went ahead and, and developed all this stuff, spent his own time and money on the dyno, testing things out, and uh, found it was actually worthwhile to do this. Uh, he started out using the uh, uh, valley pan off of a big block Chrysler and then trimmed it to fit. And then uh, adapted it to the Mopar, started bending his own, and uh, you know, uh, for the few extra bucks, why not? I'm already in here, and it can't hurt. And so there we have the splash pan installed, and it goes on top of the uh, uh, spider for the uh, rocker retainer, or I'm sorry, the lifter retainers. And uh, pretty simple deal. 
And, I mean, like I said, you can go ahead and make your own. Go out and buy yourself the uh, big block um, valley pan and trim it to size. Or you just go ahead and go to Utah Awesome and order up one of these that's already pre-bent and drilled and trimmed and ready to bolt in. So take your pick. I mean, it, and you don't have to have this. This is just one of those things that uh, makes a little bit of a difference. Nice to have, especially for towing application. Get some of the heat off the intake manifold and, uh, you know, improve it the way it runs just a little bit under load. So anyway, just my two cents. Um, again, you know, this guy's taking his own time and effort to, to prove his theories and uh, made some, spent some money doing it and is making some money or recouping some money uh, after selling the products he's designed. So either way, and there's folks out there call it snake oil, so be it. You know, do what you want. Um, believe it, don't believe it, I don't care. <laughs> you know, it, it's up to you. So, you know, for what I've got in this, it's no big deal. Like I said, I was already in, so why not? All right, one more little tidbit here. When I go to lift the fuel rail and the injectors out, I tend to go ahead and hose down the uh, bungs with uh, penetrating oil just to go ahead and make them come out a little bit easier. And then I hose them down again, and they slide in real nice and easy. And hopefully I didn't booger up an O-ring doing that. Um, should be pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So just moving the, the rail from one side over to the other. Alrighty, so there we have it. The uh, intake manifold is installed. I will tell you that if you're going to do the uh, splash pan mod, it's going to go ahead and press up against the bottom of the intake manifold just a little bit. And you're going to have to mash it down uh, with the manifold to go ahead and get the bolts to uh, settle in. Uh, what I ended up doing was starting at the front, worked my way back, just went ahead and pulled it down snug. I did not go ahead and torque them down. But I just went ahead and pulled it down snug and just, like I said, worked my way side to side, working back uh, from the front of the motor, just to go ahead and, and get it pulled down. Then I came back with the torque wrench and went ahead and torqued everything down to 12 inch pounds, I'm sorry, 12 foot pounds, forget inch pounds, 12 foot pounds in a circular pattern, starting over here, crossways, back, around and then just working my way out in a spiral pattern. Uh, in doing that, I ended up having to go ahead and run the pattern about five times before the there was no more turning of the torque wrench. I mean, it was just a matter of snug it down, torque to, to spec, and then move on, work your way around, come back in and check your torque. Okay, well, yeah. It's not fully torqued again, and just keep working that pattern until it is. All of them are 12 foot-pounds as soon as you go ahead and put a wrench to it. Uh, that way they're fully seated. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So we're good to go there. I also noticed there's a port back here. That guy, I'm assuming, is for a temperature sending unit, maybe, the other one. Um, again, this is a 99 manifold. I don't know what was in there. I don't remember a passage being there, but uh, it's by the water jacket, so it's entirely probable that it's going to be for a temperature sending unit. Um, Chrysler might have moved that second unit to the back. Um, and if that's the case, great, wonderful. Uh, the one that goes to, well, Either way, I, I may just cap it because I don't need it. I've got the, uh, the other gauge and the upper radiator hose. So uh, that being said, I'll probably plug that one and then put the sending unit in that one right there because it's in the right position for the wire harness. Okay, so that guy way back there by between those two intake manifold bolts, <laughs> it's not a threaded port. It's a uh, part of a boss for a bracket. There's another one directly behind the manifold. I'm assuming it's part of the transmission bracketry that was used on the later truck, but not on this one. So I'm not gonna worry about it. <laughs> but I did go ahead and get my water temperature sending unit for the computer uh, put in. So we're good to go there. I uh, moved that over from the other manifold. I did go ahead and trace it back uh, using the schematics last night. 
the single wire uh, sending unit is for the gauge. The dual wire sending unit is for the computer. So the dual wire sending unit is right there. All right, so here we are coming along. Uh, breeze has kicked up just a little bit, but no big deal. And it's just kind of feeding into this front that's coming, but it actually feels kind of nice today. Uh, thermostat housing, or I'm sorry, yeah, thermostat housing is on. I had to enlarge the bolt holes just a little bit for some reason. Um, I, 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 I don't know, but <laughs> if I try to go ahead and bolt it in place without enlarging those holes just a little bit, um, one bolt would go ahead and go in, the other one was trying to go ahead and go in at an angle, and you know, cross threading is only tight once. I don't like leaks, so we'll fix that. Uh, like I said, the temperature sending units in place, intake air manifold, temperature sensor, pressure, whatever the heck that guy right there is, is in place, so we're good to go there. Um, oh, yeah, so the old manifold, so the old manifold came off of the 1994 donor motor which was a smog motor. It had EGR on it, and there's my fancy EGR block off plate and the port cap. Um, apparently, well, I didn't have the fitting that came from the intake or the exhaust manifold to the intake. And so since I didn't have that fitting, that brass plug sort of kind of fit and it's just JB welded in place and JB Weld has held up just fine. So, better than the plenum gasket did. So there's the bottom side of the intake manifold I just pulled off. Um, and that's the steel plenum plate. I mean, you can see I cleaned that thing up pretty good before I put it all back together again. But that gasket right in here started sucking air and oil and causing pinging issues. So, no more of that. Uh, like I said, it's, it's good to go. Uh, I'm going to save this manifold, just put it on the shelf as a, a spare part. Uh, I'm not too big into these motors, but at the same point, it's a serviceable, man serviceable manifold. One more time in English. Um, yeah, it's a serviceable manifold. Yeah, it's got the EGR port in the back, which is, so to speak, less desirable. But in reality, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, the long and short of it is... Um, it's sealed off. It's going to continue to stay sealed off. The JB Weld and brass plug are working just fine. So if anybody wants this or if I have a need for it later on down the road, I've still got it on the shelf just like I had the other one. And here's another one from Mortski. No flexi hose. Got me a freaking factory hose and cut it to fit to work with what I needed. So no flexi hose here, brother. Okay, so here we are. I've got the alternator back in place. That's all hooked up now. That side of the motor is pretty well done other than uh, throttle cables and cruise control vacuum. And speaking of vacuum, this is part of what I'm going to use to connect the PCV. I'm going to hook that over to the other side of the manifold because that's where the port is. Try and bring it around the back side of the motor and then plug into the PCV on this valve cover. So I've got a few pieces to cobble together and hopefully this will do it. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I've got my vacuum line hooked up here off the manifold. Comes back here by the distributor. See it kind of flopping around by the spark plug wire. From there, I'm gonna go into a 90 off of this and then and bring it along the backside of the motor and over here to the passenger side and splice back in again. So let's see how this works out. Okay, so PCV is all hooked up now. Comes off the driver's side of the intake manifold, runs along to the back, through that elbow right there, through the hard line, through another elbow, back to hard line, back to soft line, and into the passenger side valve cover. And it's got to trim off that zip tie. Okay, so everything's put back together except the air cleaner and uh, refilling the cooling system. I, I've got one hose clamp where the upper hose joins into that uh, thermostat housing that uh, needs to be replaced. The, it's one of those 
screw type clamps and it, it's one of the cheap ones and so we kind of twist it out and I'm gonna go down to Paul's Valley get uh, a nice stainless steel one hopefully and put that together that I can fill the cooling system and put the air cleaner back on and we should be ready to go uh, everything else is hooked up now the PCV system is plumbed in I've got all the wiring hooked back up the way it belongs uh, yeah, I, I think we're pretty well there. Yes. And yeah, I, I've spent about three, three and a half hours working on this today. But at the same point, I've also been stopping to do video. I've been taking time cleaning things up that I didn't like. I still need to go ahead and drain the oil and put fresh oil in because, you know, we got uh, a little bit of antifreeze in the oil. Um, I don't like it floating around in there. So, uh, granted, there's not much. I was able to go ahead and soak up a lot of it, but just the same, I've got fresh oil. Why take any chances with it floating around in there? There's no reason for that. So, we'll change the oil before we fire it up. Uh, that way, we'll have almost all of the coolant out of it. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in good shape. So, figure uh, between the parts run and everything else, another hour and she'll be fully functional. Yes. Okay, so I got the drain pan out underneath Ethel right now. I'm draining the oil that was in there back out. And uh, yeah, there was about maybe five or six ounces of oil in the bottom. Uh, you know, <laughs> when you go ahead and pull the drain plug and you don't end up with any real oil of substance on your work gloves, that uh, water or coolant came out first. And that's what happened here. So anyway, I'm just gonna let that drain while I go make my parts run to get that hose clamp. It's annoying that I had one clamp fail, and of course I don't have that one clamp around here. And I'd rather not just go ahead and throw some ginormous clamp on there just because I've got, or I don't have what I need. So I'll get the right one and we'll put her back together. Okay, gonna rant for just a quick minute. Um, it's really sad, uh, the state that this country has become. We've become a nation of consumers rather than producers, and the end result is an endless supply of Chineseium that just, you can't get past it anymore. I needed a hose clamp because the hose clamp that I, I was using, you know, the, the screw type that normally lasts almost forever, uh, failed. When I had, well, actually I actually had two that failed. One, the uh, screw backed all the way out, but the clamp didn't want to back off. The other one, the body that the screw threads into, decided to go ahead and distort and twist and fall apart. And of course, these are the wonderful Chineseium clamps. You used to be able to get the nice stainless steel ones uh, manufactured by Ideal. If you went to the parts store and knew what to ask for, you get the bulk box from behind the counter and uh, you go ahead and have a, a good supply of, of good quality clamps. And that's not the case today. So this is the booger right here that failed. And you can see right inside, well, if I can get my fat thumb out of the way, you can see right inside there, it's starting to spread apart and it doesn't want to hold a clamp load anymore. So I w went to go get the good old fashioned Ideal brand clamps, made the USA, the good solid ones that seemingly last forever and this is what we have now a box of chineseium it's more of the same there's more of them in here but uh, it's the same stuff it's softer metal it's just kind of pressed together and it'll work for a while but uh it's not gonna last so i got a box full of them now and i get my lunch so i'm gonna eat my lunch put the hose clamps on or put the hose clamp on put the drain plug in and uh, go ahead refill the cooling system refill the oil and we should be good to go so there's that i'm off my soapbox it's time to eat all right well there we have it moment of truth everything's been put back together now all my stuff's hooked back up where it belongs new hose clamp full coolant Oil's back in it. Let's see what this is going to do. No hesitation. <laughs> you start 
hard like now. Oil pressure's looking good. We are coming up on 70 pounds at idle cold. Temperature's gonna take a while to come up. Voltage is looking okay-ish. Oh yeah, forgot to hook up the alternator back to the battery. Duh. Okay, alternator cable is hooked back up to the battery feed at the power control module. Power control, whatever. So here we go, one more time. Woo, there we go. Yeah, that's much better. Now we're charging. We're 14.1. All right, this is good. This is very, very good. And she's happy. She seems very happy. So, gonna let her warm up while I put tools away, and then it's gonna be time for a road test. And just like that, we missed the epic volcano. I was busy putting tools away and letting her idle, and the upper hose blew apart at the uh, union for the uh, temperature sending unit. I guess I had the hose clamp not quite in the proper position, and lo and behold, she popped her cork. So it was a steamy mess, and now I gotta put that back together and clean that whole mess up. But it is what it is. That's why I was letting her sit here idling to make sure I didn't screw something else up. So there we go. All right, so entirely my own fault. I uh, wasn't paying attention when I put the hose clamp on the upper hose here, and so, of course, being that little piece of aluminum adapter hoo -yah, there's that lip machined into it right there. And of course, I had the clamp on top of the lip rather than under the lip. So entirely my fault. Um, <laughs> gallon of antifreeze wasted. Uh, yeah, okay, well, hey, Peak Squad, guess what? Coming to make another visit. Go get some more. Well, that was quite the show when she blew her wad. <laughs> um, I wasn't, well, my phone was in the truck at the time and I wasn't diving through the steam to go get it. I've been around radiators when they've blown out before and it's not pleasant. Fortunately, it was just the upper hose, but still, it's like, <laughs> damn it, man. Where, where is my camera? Oh yeah, it's in the truck, dummy. So anyway, uh, like I said, I own it and I'm off to town to go get some more coolant because yeah, that was fun. That's a hell of a way of steam cleaning under the side of the hood. Anyway, back shortly. All right, so here we go. One more time with feeling. Uh, another gallon and a half of antifreeze inside. And the hose clamp is properly located this time. Fingers crossed, dumbass. Um, anyway, so let's give her a go. And we're going to let her run and do her thing. see any fuel leaking earlier. Um, I said the hose was entirely my fault. 100% entirely my fault. I was getting a little bit tired and a little bit careless and that's what happens. So let us warm up the operating temperature, make sure we don't have any more unfortunate incidents and I'll road test it. All right, well, we're still idling. We still haven't blown the volcano yet, but I'm seeing steam start to come off the top of the radiator. So the thermostat's opened up at this point, and it's just going ahead and, and evaporating off the water that was on the outside and like, hosing everything off. I'm going to stand back here, though, because <laughs> I don't want to go ahead and be downrange if I screwed up a second time. Yeah, okay. I know my work better than that, but anyway, uh, I want to wait till it goes ahead and kicks the electric fan on, that way it's 
fully up to temperature and it's going to go ahead and leave some extra coolant out of the overflow because the overflow tank is kind of full anyway. And that's fine, no big deal, but uh, I think we're good. Actually, I know we're good. Yeah, kind of hard to see it from this angle, but we're almost 200 degrees. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're coming up on temperature. The fan should kick on any time now. And uh, I, I think we're, we're good to go. Uh, staying corrected, we are at uh, about 185, not quite 190, about 190 maybe. So, anyway, it, the thermostat's open now because it's got coolant, or I'm oh, sorry, it's got coolant. It's got steam coming off the uh, top of the radiator where I've got some water from rinsing things off. I'm still smelling a little bit of coolant, but I don't know if it's because. It's everywhere, <laughs> or if I've got leaks. So I'm gonna give it a few minutes here to see what we do. So true story, uh, one afternoon while driving my old uh, power wagon from uh, Marine Corps Air Station, El Toro, California, back to Arizona to put in storage before going overseas for a six month deployment, um, I went ahead and was having some overheating issues and stopped at the Arizona border check station on, uh, would have been, uh, geez, what was it? I-10, I-10, uh, coming right across the border from California. And so anyway, I pull over and as I go to, or I open the hood of the truck and right after I open the hood of the truck, the top seam on my radiator blew right out and it was all down my pant legs and I'm out there on the side of the highway uh, dancing around, jumping, trying to go ahead and pull my blue jeans away from my legs so I don't lose my skin. And <laughs> because I was going to deploy, everything that I owned was in that truck, including all my tools. And so I had a torch and solder and a hammer and, and everything. I mean, you name it, I had it. And so I managed to go ahead and beat the radiator back together where it split at the tank and solder it back up on the side of the road and <laughs> drove on the extra four hours home. But uh, I also left the radiator cap uh, loose so it didn't go ahead and build so much pressure and it wouldn't blow out again. Uh, I, I dealt with it when I got back six months later. But yeah, there you go. So not a huge fan of being around radiators that are getting ready to pop. Okay, there we have it. Now keep in mind this is a 195 thermostat because that's what the computer wants. I, I don't have this reprogrammed to run a 180 degree thermostat. Uh, so when it hits 210, that fan will go ahead. Actually, I think 210, 215, some, somewhere thereabouts. Get away, wasp, yellow jacket, whatever. Go away, bug. Um, anyway, once it reaches that temperature, that fan's going to go ahead and kick on, do what it's supposed to do. But, uh, oh, hey, yeah, there we go. So now I'm venting a little bit of coolant out of the overflow. I can see it in the tube there, which is fine. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. I accidentally overfilled it, go figure. But uh, yeah, so it's gonna bleed off what it can't use into the overflow tank. And then once the overflow tank's full, it'll just go ahead and, and dump onto the ground. So sue me, Greta, see if I care. Anyway, uh, I think we're about ready to road test. And there it is, the fan just kicked on. She hasn't popped her cork yet, so uh, road test time. All right, well, I don't hear the telltale pinging that I used to hear, so uh, I think we may have a win. I honestly think we got a win. I love this old Ford. I'm not a Ford guy for this thing. Somebody wants one. Well, it's not the win I was hoping for. She still pings under load. With torque converter locked up and the uh, transmission and overdrive. So I gotta start looking at other things. Maybe it's fuel sink issue. Well, I'll say this at least uh, it's not as pink sensitive as it was before. Uh, before, when it was under load, it would pink badly, very, very badly with torque converter locked up. Uh, now it's not as bad.
said, it's better than it was. It's uh, it's still not perfect. It's not 100 percent, but it's a big improvement. Um, the, the the pinging issue is not as bad as it used to be. So, and there's no doubt that the plenum gasket was leaking. I'm fairly certain it's uh, sealed up now. But we'll go ahead and keep tabs on that. Um, like I said, it, it might be a fuel sink issue. I've never put this thing on a computer after I had got it running to make sure that the fuel's in sync. And so that may be part of the issue that I'm having now. And uh, of course, you know, fuel timing not being correct or the timing advance, whatever, not being correct because you can't really adjust it. Um, that's probably causing part of my issue as well. But uh, at least it does feel a little bit more drivable than it did. Anyway, uh, back to the house and uh, uh, wrap this one up. Well, there we have it, folks. Uh, I didn't get the end result I was hoping for. I, I really wanted to go ahead and be done with this uh, pinging under load issue. Um, like I said, it is better. It's not 100% improved, but it's, I, I'd say, at least 50% improved. Um, I can probably go ahead and switch this back over to the stock tune and try and work with it from there. Uh, like I said, maybe put the computer on it, um, have somebody with a, a tool and go ahead and set the fuel sink. Uh, I don't have that. I don't have that ability. So it's going to be either a dealership or somebody that's got that actual tool. And th there may be another issue in there as well. Um, I don't know if this is one of those where the i i installed the cam in this the way i've always installed cams straight up dot to dot and i think there was some discussion that well no one of them's uh, dots are both supposed to be straight down on this motor i don't know and that might be true and that might have something to do with it all of those issues are going to get addressed when i go ahead and, and do the cylinder heads next spring uh, i was really hoping to have this thing ready to go ahead and do more towing if needed. It still does fine around the, the house and the property, but uh, you know, it'd be nice to go ahead and not worry about putting a load on the back of it and having to start knocking and pinging. So anyway, um, it is what it is. Uh, I, I got the job done today and I knew I was gonna be going back into this later, uh, probably four or five months from now after the winter weather clears out. And so with that being said, um, it, it's nothing I can't live with right now. Like I said, it is improved, but it, it's, it's disappointing because it's not what I was hoping for. So anyway, I'm done rambling. Um, again, if you like what you're seeing, great. Uh, give a thumbs up, leave a comment. Uh, if you don't like it, that's fine, move on. Not a big deal. Uh, I'm not offended, I'm not hurt. 52 people out there seem to like what I'm doing, at least from time to time. So uh, <laughs> there is that. And I appreciate my subscribers. I don't do this for pay. I don't do this. I'm not sponsored. I, I do this because I enjoy doing this. Uh, I This is 100% me doing my stuff on my time. So anyway, like I said, y'all be good to each other. Be safe. And uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, you know, th this is a community thing. This isn't competition. I'm not out there trying to go ahead and have the most subscribers or the biggest YouTube channel or anything else. Uh, I'm just trying to go ahead and share some information and helpfully help somebody out. So y'all be good. We'll see you next time.